the Rube Goldberg computers from components I scratched at the local university. When the IBM PC came out, I wrote video games in assembly language because there were none available on the market. That's the sheer necessity piece. Um, and years later in grad school, I worked on computer vision um, and then high performance 3D rendering. So today I'm going to tell you about an algorithm I worked on at Bing. It was really a labor of love for about seven years and one that challenged much of the conventional wisdom about search. When I joined Bing, the original code base called Monarch was beginning to show its age. And you know how it goes. It was initially created by a small team that was mainly focused on growing market share. And then it grew organically with lots of unrelated features. New engineers joined the team and others left. And the reasons for key decisions were lost in the mists of time. And coders could no longer distinguish between incidental constraints and those that were fundamental. Now, Bing was enjoying some success in the market. And this was putting competing demands on the code base. Here's an example. We did a user study, and we found that the leading cause of dissatisfaction was not finding the right web page because it wasn't in the index. So there was an initiative to grow the number of documents that were crawled and indexed. At the same time, our query load was increasing faster than we could build out data centers to handle the load. So there was pressure to improve query performance so that each machine could handle more users. The solution was a technique called early termination. Instead of scanning the full index, the query processor would stop after identifying some threshold number of matching documents. So for performance, early termination is like a drug. And after that first taste, it was easy to turn up the dosage each time we needed more performance. So as one team was racing to build out a larger index, the other team was scanning ever smaller slices of the same index. We were also reaching the point of diminishing returns on real performance optimizations. I remember an engineer who spent six months on a series of gargantuan refactorings in order to get a 1% gain in data compression. So we had to do something, and the result was the incubation that ultimately led to the BitFunnel algorithm. Now, our first run at the problem was major surgery on Monarch to move key data structures from disk to RAM and then reduce the amount of storage used by each document. Monarch used what was known as a positional index. This means that it contains one entry for each instance of a word in a document. So if a document had 43 instances of the word transistor, there would be four, 43 corresponding entries in the index. The new and improved version of Monarch, called Tiger, was a non-positional index. This meant that it used a single entry to record the fact that the document contained the word transistor, but it didn't record all 43 facts. Um, moving to a non-positional index that was stored in RAM instead of on disk boosted query performance, but it did nothing to address our growing index build times. So when Tiger launched, a batch index build sidelined thousands of machines for three hours every day doing a big MapReduce job. And we knew that these batch jobs would only grow to perhaps a day or maybe longer as we started crawling and indexing more documents. Now, Tiger was a natural evolution of the Monarch code base. With BitFunnel, we started from scratch. Our goals were to make an extremely fast query processor while reducing total system cost and allowing for lightweight real-time index updates. This last goal was critically important um, for indexing rapidly changing news and social media, but it was also important to drive down the index build costs. Now, BitFunnel is unusual. It uses a probabilistic algorithm based on Bloom filters. The approach allows us to process queries in less time, but it has a quirk. It's guaranteed to find the documents you're looking for, but sometimes it'll also find documents that have nothing to do with the query. It turns out this isn't a problem for web search because the ranker filters out the bad documents. So, spoiler alert, BitFunnel is actually really fast. Here's some telemetry from February 2017 as we deployed BitFunnel into our media search cluster. The graph shows query latencies dropping by a factor of two system-wide as we cut over to BitFunnel. Now, this graph is a little misleading because it seems to imply that BitFunnel is twice as fast as the system it replaced. It turns out that BitFunnel is actually many times faster. Let's take a look. When you type a query into Bing, a lot goes on behind the scenes. The process begins with a quick initial stage that reformulates the query to correct spelling errors and incorporate alternative phrasings, like adding New York City to queries with the abbreviation NYC. It also includes classifiers that trigger special answer cards for things like today's weather, box scores, movies. Um, and it checks to see if the query's results can be pulled from a cache. The actual search process begins in earnest with keyword matching. The goal at this stage is to identify those documents in the corpus that match a Boolean expression of terms. 
like find all documents that contain yellow in either Lab or Labrador, but not Wikipedia. The next step is the ranking algorithm, and its purpose is to sort through the matching documents and, bis and pick the best 10 to display. And the final stage extracts the captions that appear with each results and then generates the HTML that the user sees. Now, prior to BitFunnel, keyword matching was the dominant cost. BitFunnel reduced the matching time dramatically, and this led to a 50% reduction in end-to-end -end latency. Today, I'm going to focus on the data structures and algorithms that make BitFunnel fast. But first, it helps to understand how Tiger matches keywords. Most search engines are based on the concept of an inverted index. The idea is to maintain a mapping from each term to the set of documents containing the term. Documents, mapping, documents matching a Boolean expression of terms can be found by applying the same Boolean expression to sets of documents associated with each of the query terms. I find it's actually easier to explain this with pictures. So here's a really short document with just three words, and here's an empty data structure for an inverted index. Indexing a document involves adding its ID to lists associated with each of its words. So we'll make an entry for the word I, and we'll add a one indicating that document one contains the word I. We do the same thing with need, and then with money. Now let's add another document. We create an entry for everything, but this time we add a two because we're indexing the second document. Now there's already an entry for I, so we just append the two to the existing list. We can see from this list that the word I appears in both documents. A similar thing happens with need. Here come the rest of the words, under, one, and roof. Now let's add a third document. So we see now that money appears in documents one and three, while roof appears in documents two and three. Here's document number four. Now we see that money appears in three documents. Let's add one more document. So these four words complete our inverted index. Now suppose we want to process a query. Um, say we're looking for documents containing both roof and money. What we do is we find the lists associated with roof and money, and we intersect them. Now, you've probably all intersected sorted lists in a CS exercise. Here's some Python code for a generator that does this. So we start by creating iterators for each list. Then we advance each iterator to the head of its list. We're looking for entries that the lists have in common, because these are documents that contain both words. Now, as long as we're pointing to different values, we advance the pointer that lags behind. Then it's back up to the top of the loop. This time, AI lags behind, so we advance it. On the next iteration, we see that AI and BI both point to document three. This means the document contains roof, and it also contains money, so we report it as a match for our query. On the next line, we advance AI off the end of the list, and this exits the loop. So what I've shown you so far is the CS101 version of an inverted index. Now, the pseudocode on the right is pretty simple, but I want you to keep it in mind because later I'm going to show you some BitFunnel assembly code that is faster and much cleaner. Now, in the real world, things are more complex. So here's an example. Suppose we're looking for documents containing a really common term like the and a really rare term like Osvogel. By the way, does anyone know what an Osvogel is? Um, I actually came across this term, yeah. Um, yeah, it's actually, it's closer to Dutch. Um, so, uh, and I'll tell you, so I came across this um, while looking through a, a real web corpus. It was right after Aardvark, which starts with two A's, and Arg, which starts with two A's. Um, it turns out Osvogel is an archaic term for a South African vulture. Um, and I have a, happen to have a picture from my last trip to South Africa. Um, this is actually a volt of vultures. That's what a flock of vultures is called. Um, anyway. The challenge with this intersection is that we have to advance through about a million term, um, documents containing the word the before encountering one that contains the word Osvogel. Now, most search engines include some means to jump ahead. Um, these are typically complex hierarchical data structures like skip lists. The structures reduce the number of loop iterations in exchange for code complexity. So with skip lists, the pseudocode no longer fits on a slide and the global nature of these data structure usually of these data structures usually consigns us to a world of offline batch index builds now there's another problem and that is storage space um, in this example each of these entries needs at least 21 bits just to encode the document id 
So search engines use various schemes to compress these lists. Uh, one approach is to store the difference between adjacent entries. So for a common term like the, which appears every couple of documents, one can record these deltas with just a couple of bits because the deltas are small. Now, this is just a simple example. Real search engines use much more sophisticated compression algorithms. The point is that at the end of the day, the code to intersect posting lists is very complex and therefore hard to optimize. And the global nature of the data structures prevents real-time updates. So this takes us to Bitfunnel. Let me grab it. Swig. Um, now, at this point, I should introduce the next character in our saga, my partner in crime, Bob Goodwin. Um, yeah? Sorry, just a quick question about real-time updates. So skip the seem real-time updatable even if you're keeping track of the uh, deltas at every level. Um, Excuse me, the three you were talking before, obviously. If you, you need to know the sum of those you were skipping at that thousand, but I don't see why you couldn't propagate that up in lifetime. Um, you can, but um, you can't do it lock-free while well, you've got 16 other threads doing queries and things like that, and it's a bunch more operations. So um, when I circle back to the end, I'll show how the operation in BitFunnel to update it is just a trivial one. But, um, but yeah, that's the problem with uh, generalizations. Um, so anyway, uh, this is Bob Goodwin, and uh, Bob and I are about as different as possibly could be. Um, I'm analytical to, to a fault, and Bob is intuitive. I'm careful and methodical, and Bob is a bull in a china shop. He moves very fast, and he breaks lots of things. Um, I strive to deliver solid working code on time the first time, and Bob often can't find the code that produced an interesting result the night before. <laughs> um, the thing about Bob is he digs wells faster than anyone I know, and most of them are dry wells, but he digs them so fast that he actually finds more water than most. He's not formally trained in search algorithms, so he's unconstrained by conventional wisdom, and most of his ideas don't work out, but when they do, they represent solutions that no one's ever thought of. So um, we had what's known in manager speak as a complementary skill set. Um, so we decided to divide and conquer. So I started a performance analysis of Tiger while Bob went off to measure key quantities from the internet. Um, he was answering questions like, how many times does the word asparagus appear in our web crawl? or how many terms appear less than once in a million documents, or how often does a particular document appear in search results. Now, we needed these metrics to build a mathematical model of search that we could use to vet any proposed algorithm before trying it at scale. It's really hard and expensive to try something with 2,000 machines. So Bob spends months working with a large cluster of computers, slicing and dicing data, using a home homebrew mishmash of caches and hash tables, um, until one day he comes to me and he says, hey, Mike, I think we can turn my data mining software into a search engine. It's based on bit vectors, it's wicked fast, very compressed, and it makes real-time updates trivial. The secret is bloom filters. Of course, I didn't believe him, and that first day I quickly poked a bunch of holes in his idea. But two weeks later, he was back with fixes. And this pattern continued for the better part of the year. I would find problems, and Bob would find solutions. And eventually, I couldn't find anything wrong, so we set out to build a prototype. So to understand Bob's idea, it helps to understand bloom filters and how you use them to make an index. So suppose we have a very small document with just three terms. By the way, I think every um, search talk starts with suppose we have a very small document with just three terms. Um, we can encode the set of terms in the document using a fixed length bit vector, sometimes known as a document signature or a bloom filter. Now at this point, our vector is all zeros because it is the empty set. So let's add the term big. So our bloom filter is configured with a number of hash functions mapping term text to bit positions. Adding big involves setting a bit for each of the hash functions. Let's add another term. Now early on, when the filter is almost empty, the terms don't usually collide with each other. But eventually, as the filter fills up, we see terms mapping to bits that have already been set. So for example, dog maps to position 3, which was set earlier when we added big. This overlapping of bits is by design, but it does place a practical limit on the number of terms that can be added to the set. Now, testing for membership involves probing each of the hash functions for set bits. Suppose I want to test for the word cat. In this case, one of the three bits is zero, so we know that cat cannot be a member of the set. When we test for big, all three of the hashes map to ones, so we report it as a possible match. Now, why do I say possible? Well, consider the case of house. Its hashes all map to ones, so we report it as a possible match, even though house was never added to the set. So how did this happen? Well, the term brown contributed two of the set bits, 
and dog contributed another. This is what we call a false positive. Bloom filters will always report membership for items actually in the set, but on occasion they may lie and report membership for items that were never added. So let's use Bloom filters to create an index. So we'll start with a Bloom filter for the first document, document A, and then add another for document B, and document C, and document D, and so on, until we've added every document in the corpus. Now, a conjunctive query is represented as the signature of a small document that contains the terms of the query. A search involves a for loop over each of the documents. We're looking for those documents whose signatures contain all of the bits in the query. So document A cannot match because bits 2 and 9 are not set. Document B has bits 2, 5, and 9 set, so it's reported as a match. We continue iterating over documents one by one, reporting matches as we find them. We're looking for rows with bits 2, 5, and 9 set. There's another match, and we just continue to the end. There we go. Now, this algorithm is clever, and it's even elegant. Do you have a question? Yeah, you're assuming here a purely conjunctive query. Um, for this, I am. Um, we handle arbitrary Boolean expressions, and ask me at the end how we do that. that that's right. Just to follow the example. Okay, yeah, but definitely. Um, so the problem with this, this elegant appearing algorithm is that it's slow, because it involves a lot of random access reads of individual bits. But it's actually worse, because these reads actually touch the entire data structure. So to understand why, let's teleport back to a time when computers handled problems of the scale that I'm using for this example. So we'll use this Apple II to step through the algorithm again. So to check for document A, we want to read this bit and this bit. When we ask the 6502 processor to read either of these bits, it reads the entire byte. When we go to read bit 9, the same thing happens. In checking for three bits, we've managed to read the entire Bloom filter across the processor's data bus. As we continue to check documents, we march across memory, accessing each filter in its entirety until we've read them all. Now, the Bloom filters make up the search engine's primary data structure, so they're basically, we're reading all of main memory, which on an Apple II is about 48 kilobytes. Now, you'd think that things would be better today with modern processors, but we see the same problem just at a larger scale. On a web scale corpus, the filter, which is these rows, tend to be about 1,500 bits wide, and we're typically probing about six bits. So when we try to access a bit, our stick of DDR4 gives us back 512 bits. So if we do six 512-bit reads from a 1,500-bit buffer, we're almost certainly going to read the entire buffer. So we have the same pictures with the Apple II, except now to process a query on a modern machine with, say, 128 gigabytes of RAM, we're maybe going to access 120 of those gigabytes for each query. Um, that's a non-starter. Fortunately, there's a solution. Um, it turns out around the time of the Apple II, there was a fellow named Roberts, and he invented a technique called bit-sliced signatures that improves efficiency by constructing a rotated version of the index. So with this arrangement, we need only inspect the rows corresponding to the bits in the query. So to process a query, we extract the relevant rows, and then we add them together. The result is a vector of ones and zeros, where the positions with ones correspond to documents that match the query. The operation is fast, because we're reading consecutive bits and combining them 64 at a time using logical ALU operations. Now, prior to BitFunnel, this algorithm was pretty close to the state of the art for signatures, but it had a fatal flaw. Um, the time to perform this intersection is proportion proportional to the number of documents in the index. So if we had a billion documents, we're going to look at a billion bits in each row. So contrast this with post lists, which are very efficient um, because of those hierarchical skip structures. Um, they only include entries corresponding to instances of terms, instead of all the zeros I have here that correspond to every document. Um, and they can leap over many entries in a single bound. So this brings us to the first bit funnel innovation. It's a generalization of blocked signatures that we call higher rank rows. And was there a question out there? OK. Um, a higher rank row is just a shorter, lower resolution version of a row, but it can be scanned more and it can be scanned more quickly, but the catch is it creates more false positives. So let's take a look. Here's a row with 32 bits, each of which corresponds to a single document, and we'll call this a rank zero row. We can construct a higher rank version by taking the left half and the right half and orienting them together to produce a rank one row with 16 bits. In this new shorter row, each bit position corresponds to two documents. 
Now we can compete this, we can repeat this process, splitting the row and merging its halves, yielding a rank two row where each bit corresponds to four documents. We continue this process through additional iterations, losing information while producing ever shorter rows. The shorter rows can be scanned more quickly but because they have fewer bits, but they introduce more false positives because each bit is less definitive. The bit maps to multiple documents rather than a single document. Now, let's take a look at how we use higher rank rows. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so this is the one that would be a billion wide if we had a billion documents in our index. Yeah, so each document is a bit, and, um, and this is basically each document is two bits, so um, like the third bit over here and the third bit halfway through, there's like a zero over here for the third bit, but there's a one for a third bit there, and when we OR them together, we, this says that at least one of the two documents matches, maybe both, but at least one. Um, in general, yes, um, if you want to get that much resolution, but you don't necessarily need to do that. Um, so, for instance, with phrases, um, because we store the subphrases. So if we have New York City, we store New York, and we store York City, and we store New York and City. For that, the phrase New York City doesn't need to go all the way down to rank zero, because there's enough information in all the other rows to help. So. Um, Correct. Um, and um, someone in Alistair Moffat's group after SIG IR did an experiment to try sorting the documents, thinking that it might actually affect it. And um, I don't know if they're, what they're doing with this, but they felt that it was inconclusive. So, but they're still looking at that. Um, so suppose we're looking for a term, and we've used our three hash functions to identify three rows. With normal rows, we just intersect them and be done, but then we'd have to scan each row in its entirety. We can reduce the scanning time by creating higher rank rows when we build the index. So for example, we might combine the four parts of row two and store a quarter length row. Or we might combine the two halves of row one and store a half length row. With this index, each hash function maps to a row that could be full length, half length, or quarter length. Finding matches now involves intersecting rows with different lengths. But what does this even mean? How can we intersect rows that don't have the same number of bits? Well, conceptually, we're intersecting expanded versions of each of the rows. So take row two, for example. Each bit corresponds to four documents. So its expanded version is just four copies of the shorter row. In row one, each bit corresponds to two documents. So its expanded version is just two copies. Now, we could just expand each of the rows at query time and intersect them like before, but we'd lose the speed while still increasing the false positive rate. It turns out that with careful reuse of intermediate results, BitFunnel can perform this intersection directly on the shorter rows without ever having to expand them. Here's how it works. We left align all of the rows, and then we intersect the portions they have in common. Now, we just intersected three bytes, but we can use the intersection of the first two bytes by shifting to a new alignment and intersecting again. Then we start over at another location. We intersect three rows and then we reuse the intermediate result at a new alignment. In this way, we produce a complete result vector without ever expanding the shorter rows. Now, when I introduced Bloom filters, I mentioned that they were configured with a number of hash functions. My example used three hash functions, and when we rotated the data structure, the three hash functions became three rows. It turns out that the optimal number of rows to use for each term depends on its frequency in the corpus. So let's take a look. Here's another row corresponding to 32 documents. And suppose we've configured the row with a 50% bit density. So this means that each bit has an even chance of being set. So out of the 32 bits, roughly half of them are ones. Now let's query for a fairly common term, one that appears in a quarter of all documents. In this case, eight of our bits, the ones shown in red, correspond to the eight documents we're looking for. The other bits are just noise, and they're coming from other terms that share the row. If we were to examine just this one row, we would report eight true matches and eight false matches. As a signal to noise ratio, this is horrible. We'd be reporting one false match for each true match. Now we can improve the situation by intersecting with another row. Notice how the red bits that correspond to the true matches all line up while the black noise bits are mostly uncorrelated. When we intersect the two rows, a lot of the noise cancels out, giving us an eight to one signal to noise ratio. 
Now, this is pretty acceptable, but let's see what happens if the term appears in fewer documents. Suppose we remove the term from these four documents. We've effectively transferred four from the true match column to the false positives column, which puts us in a situation where we have more noise than signal. So we can reduce the noise by intersecting with another row. Again, the red bits line up and the black ones don't, so the intersection drops the noise down to a single false positive. Now let's take the term out of two more documents. So our new term appears just twice in 32 documents. Um, and once again, we have more noise than signal. So we add a fourth row, and now this time all of the noise drops out. Now let's make the term so rare that it appears in just a single document. Again, we're in the situation of reporting as many false positives as true positives. So we add a fifth row, and this eliminates the noise. Now you're probably beginning to see a pattern here. Uh, rarer terms require more rows to drive down the false positives. So we know what higher rank rows are, and we've seen how to intersect them. And we also know that rarer terms tend to need more rows. Now we need to decide how many rows at each rank are assigned to each term. And we call these assignments term treatments. Here are some examples of real world term treatments. Now one thing that's immediately apparent from this slide is the relationship between a term's frequency and its treatment. Rarer terms tend to have more rows, and they tend to make greater use of shorter rows. So we can see in the upper left-hand corner that a common term like with, which appears in half of all web documents, is assigned its own full-length row. While info, which appears once in 10 documents, is assigned a pair of rows, one full-length and the other half-length. As the terms get rarer, they get more rows until in the lower right corner, an extremely rare term like Osvogel is assigned nine rows, some of which are really short. Now, here's another way to look at the intuition behind the number of rows. Suppose we're looking for a term that appears once in a million documents. And if our false positive rate is, say, one in 100 documents, we're never going to be able to spot the true matches in a sea of false positives. It's like trying to hear a distant radio station through an ocean of static. We can lower the false positive rate by adding more hashes or rows until the noise of the false positives falls below the signal of the terms we're looking for. So as we tune our radio dial, the static drops away and the song comes through loud and clear. So what about row length? Why is it that rarer terms tend to make greater use of shorter rows? Well, we'd use shorter rows everywhere if we could because they're quicker to scan. Um, the reason that rarer terms make greater use of shorter rows is that you can't stuff a common term into a short row. So suppose we had a rank six row. This is a row where each bit corresponds to 64 documents. If we were using this row for a term that appears once in every 64 documents, we'd end up setting every bit in the row, and there'd be no information content there. Now, you might wonder whether there's a closed form solution for optimal term treatments, and I don't know the answer. We actually used a brute force optimization to sort through these treatments um, to find ones yielding a certain signal to noise ratio while balancing a trade-off between query processing time and memory consumption. It turns out there's about a billion different term treatments, and if we evaluate each one at each IDF value, it takes a couple seconds during system configuration. So let's try a simple query. Um, suppose we're looking for treacherous movies. BitFunnel maintains a mapping from each term to its treatment. The treatment gives the number of hashes at each rank, and this gives us the rows, which we isolate, interleave, and then intersect. Now this slide gets at the essence of why BitFunnel is fast. Let's just focus in on the first four rows. And to make the math easy, let's assume that each row has a 10% bit density. So on average, the bits that are set are about 10 bits apart. When we intersect the first two rows, the ones in the result vector will be about 100 bits apart. So this spacing already exceeds the 64-bit width of our accumulator. So at every other quad word, if we don't see a match, we're seeing a register full of zeros. And when this happens, we can bail out because we know that further intersections will not find matches. Now, after intersecting three rows, the ones in the result vector are 1,000 bits apart. So if we don't see a match, we're skipping every other cache line. A uh, cache line's 512 bits, like from that uh, stick of DDR RAM. Um, by the time we get to four rows, the ones are 10,000 bits apart. They're about 20 cache lines apart. So at this point, we rarely access cache lines in the gray rows unless there's a match. So evaluating the query involves reading the four shortest rows in their entirety, and then another eight cache misses per match. So remember that Python pseudocode I showed you earlier? I was using it to demonstrate how classical search engines intersect lists of documents. Let's take a look at how this works in BitFunnel. 
So we're going to start with the same two terms, but instead of looking at posting lists, we get term treatments, which give us the number of hashes at each rank. In this case, roof gets one hash into a pool of long rows and two hashes into a pool of short rows. Money, which is slightly more common, gets one hash into each of these pools. We use the hashes to find the rows, uh, two short rows and a long for roof and a short and long row for money. And then we interleave the rows like we saw before. And now we'll assign x64 machine registers to each row. So each register holds a pointer to the address in memory where the row starts. And the row is just an array of 64-bit values, also known as quad words. So we begin the intersection process by loading the first quad word from row 8 into the accumulator. And on the Xeon processor, this is a 64-bit operation. So each bit in a short row corresponds to a pair of documents. Um, so we're actually loading bits for 128 documents in a single operation. So the next step is we end the accumulator with the first quad word of the second row. This stores the intersection of the first two rows in the accumulator. Now we check to see whether the accumulator is zero, because there's a possibility that the intersection cleared all of the bits, in which case there can be no matching documents and we're done. Otherwise, we intersect row 10 and again check for zero. Now at this point, our computation bifurcates. First we're going to intersect with the left halves of rows 11 and 12, and then we'll backtrack and intersect with the right halves. Since the code for the left and the right halves is the same, we'll just use a subroutine call. The call's parameterized by the value in register CX, which specifies the starting offset into the long rows. So the left row has an offset of zero, while the right row has an offset of one quad word. So um, the details don't matter too much, but the first line in the green with the XOR, that's just a cute way to set the RCX register to zero. Now, before making the call to process the left side, we save the accumulator by pushing it onto the stack so that we can restore it when backtracking to process the right side. So now we just go down the left side, and we end with row 11 and check for zero, and then we end with row 12 and again check for zero. Now at this point, after intersecting all five rows, any bits that are still set are reported as potential matches. And then we return from the subroutine, we restore the accumulator from the stack, and then we increment the offset in RCX. And now when we call the subroutine, we'll intersect with the right half. So we intersect with uh, row 11, jump with zero. We intersect with the right half of row 12, check for zero, report matches, and return. Now this scrap of code just processed the first quad word in each short row and the first two quad words in each long row. We can process the rows in their entirety by wrapping the whole thing in a for loop. So that's the matcher, every last opcode. Now let's compare it with the Python code. Um, the first thing to keep in mind is that the Python code is just pseudocode. It doesn't handle compression, but in BitFunnel, the compression is baked into the data structure through the use of Bloom filters and higher rank rows. It's the same story for skipping. The code on the right makes no provision for skipping ahead, but BitFunnel accomplishes this through its use of higher rank rows combined with zero checks. If we were to compile the code on the right, it would result in many more machine ops than the code on the left, and this is before adding the complexity for compression and skipping. But this isn't the whole story. It turns out that the code on the left is almost perfect for efficient execution by modern processors. Um, think first about L1 cache behavior. The vast majority of the reads are sequential access quad word reads in the rows. Nearly every time a quad word read triggers a cache miss, we also read the seven other quad words that are brought into the cache. Our only other memory accesses are opcodes of the inner loop, which are already in the L1 cache, and a small amount of stack, which is also in the cache. The code's also really good for branch prediction. The first four zero checks nearly always fail, and in the absence of a match, the remaining zero checks nearly always succeed. The loop termination check, shown in blue, always fails except on the last iteration. Um, so we've seen how the BitFunnel inner loop is more compact and, and more efficient, but the best reason to use BitFunnel is its ability to perform real-time index updates. Adding a new document is as simple as setting some bits in an array, and this is an operation that can be performed lock-free and done in the presence of multiple readers. So I want to close by sharing some of our learnings. So it goes without saying that BitFunnel is fast, but there were other learnings. The first is that we never would have discovered BitFunnel had we listened to conventional wisdom. You see, in the late 90s, an influential paper made a compelling case that signatures were inferior to posting lists when judged by any meaningful criteria. And the impact on the field was dramatic. Overnight, a once promising approach fell out of favor, and this discouraged commercial adoption and dampened enthusiasm for research in the area. 
When we shared our early findings with experts in the field, they pushed back on our results and insisted that we must have made a mistake somewhere. Um, they didn't know where. It turned out we didn't make a mistake, and neither did the late 90s papers. Um, there were, these papers were just relying on a set of assumptions that no longer held true. So another learning, um, which is a especially compelling one for an engineer, is that the best, best technology doesn't always win. Getting Bing to adopt BitFunnel was an uphill battle that continued long after we convinced the team that our approach did, in fact, work. The challenge was that Bing had made enormous investments in training and in a tooling ecosystem around Monarch and Tiger. So even if BitFunnel excelled at its primary mission, the costs and risks of integrating it into the Bing pipeline made it less compelling. And we face a similar problem with BitFunnel, the open source project. The problem is that BitFunnel is a C++ search library. It's not wrapped in a RESTful web service, and it doesn't come with an ecosystem of stemmers and word breakers and PDF file readers available in systems like Lucene, Elastic, and Solar. Um, BitFunnel may be a lot faster and provide real-time index updates, but you can't read about it on Stack Overflow. So only the largest and most sophisticated engineering organizations can afford the engineering work necessary to turn a search library into a fully functioning search engine. So um, engineers yearn for the freedom that comes with a blank page, but it's actually really hard um, when you're out there on your own. In BitFunnel, our insanely high query rate forced us to implement the entire stack from scratch. So we needed a JIT compiler for that assembly code I was showing you, and LLVM wasn't fast enough. We had to write our own TCP IP stack to use with a custom multi-threaded server based on IO completion ports. We wrote our own memory allocator and matched, mapped most of our virtual memory. And this work took forever. It seemed like 90% of our coding had nothing to do with the algorithm. The good news is we were able to get the work done efficiently because we were a small team with low overhead and no legacy constraints. We were free to use tools like Git and continuous integration while the rest of Bing was saddled with an eight-hour build and a check-in system that took weeks to integrate changes. So um, since we had no users, we could refactor at will. This was really important in keeping the complexity down. Um, so having to do with research and innovation, there's this saying that sharks must keep swimming or they'll die. And the same applies to research and software development. I was a poor researcher in grad school because I felt I needed to see the entire path all the way to the end before taking the, my first steps. And I've learned over my career that forward, and forward motion is more important than careful foresight. Uh, the fact is we can't predict the future, and we're rarely even right about the framing of the problems, let alone their solutions. Most insight comes from trying things, and often your most impactful work is something you never would have predicted at the outset. We see analogies to this advice in warnings not to prematurely optimize code and in the appeal of iterative development versus the waterfall model. So my closing note is to follow your heart. BitFunnel's likely the most fulfilling and impactful thing I've done in a 35-year career, and I'm immensely proud of the work. The key factor in my success with the project was that I was able to follow my heart. When you follow your heart, more often than not, everything just works. You get superhuman powers, and code just seems to write itself. So I'll close with an analogy from my personal life. Around the time that I started working on BitFunnel, I also embarked on a journey to learn how to draw and paint and sculpt. I was passionate about art as much as with BitFunnel, and I took courses for years, and then I joined a classical atelier. And my passion gave me the strength to power through the discouraging days, the monotony of drawing plaster casts and copying from the old masters. But every so often, I'd have a really good day, and everything would just flow. So after years of painting classical still life scenes, you know, bread and grapes and wine bottles and the little lemon peel curling off the edge of the table, after all that, I never dreamed I'd be painting giant diagonal cutters, but in the end, this painting came out of nowhere and it just painted itself. So follow your passions and keep moving all the time. Thanks. And it looks like we have about five, six, seven minutes for questions. Yeah. Did you make use of document term frequency in Tiger? Am I correct? There's no way to incorporate that in this For ranking, you mean? Um, yeah. So Tiger. Um, so the question he's asking: um, When you have a traditional search search engine with posting lists, where you have these entries for the document IDs, um, and each of those entries is a fact that this term occurred in the document, you can also store a number there that says how often the term appeared in the document. And so typically. Um, there's a ranking technique um, that, um, there's one called BM25F, and it basically says um, 
the more a term appears in the document and the less the term appears in the corpus. So if it's a really rare distinguishing term like Osvogel, and it appears a lot of times in the document, it's going to score more. Whereas meanwhile, a common term like the that appeared occasionally in the document is going to score less. Um, so with the um, posting list, you can put this payload of the frequency of the terms in the document with everything. With BitFunnel, we don't have this luxury because we just have this big array of bits that just kind of sort of tells you maybe this, this, um, docu this term appears in the document, but only if you have the six other rows that also tell you that. Um, what we did is we built a forward index that contains all of this information. So a forward index is based on a document number. You can look up what's in the document. And um, if we have more time afterwards, I can tell you a bunch of the tricks we did to make that compressed. But um, that was also one of the reasons that um, people moved away from signature files back in the late 90s was because of the perceived cost of the forward index. Um, yeah. Um, to, for um, term frequency information, um, not to improve BitFunnel. We did stuff with that when we were trying, when Bob was doing all his work to try to figure out how many of different things were on the internet. There's so many terms on the internet that you can be hard pressed to store them all just to count how many of them are there. Um, but yeah, we didn't use it with BitFunnel directly. Um, you had a question? Yeah. Well, let me talk about a couple things with that. So if you have the positional index where you're recording, you're making an entry for each instance of the word in the document, you can actually store the word's position in the document. And if you have that, you can do things like phrase queries because you advance your pointers and when you find two that match, you just go and see if the second word in the phrase is one further along than the other one. Um, as soon as you get to non-positional indexes, whether it's Tiger, the thing that we made from Monarch or BitFunnel, um, you lose that opportunity because there's nowhere to store that information. Um, you don't know exactly where the words are, and you also don't know the proximity beyond they're in the same document. So um, we ended up putting phrase support in BitFunnel because a non-positional index just um, can't tell you about phrases, let alone things that are just nearby. So phrases is a really specific case of things that are nearby. Um, in BitFunnel, the way we put phrases in is n-grams all the way up to length 8. We just added a, an entry for each n-gram. And it turns out this is efficient because the n-gram for length 8 relies on the fact that you've already matched the n-grams for length 7, and they rely on the fact that you've matched 6. So the length 8 n-gram, because it's rare, would need a zillion rows to find it to drive the noise down. But it actually only needs a row or a fraction of a row because you've got all this other stuff. Um, Tiger was not as lucky in that respect. Um, they got rid of the positional stuff, and they still needed to um, handle queries. So they, um, they did a big um, analysis of what, was queried, what phrases were queried for and what phrases were in documents, and they indexed the qu phrases they thought people would look for. And then on other stuff, they would actually, once they got a match for the document that contained the words, they'd crack the document open, and they'd root through it and see if the phrase was there. So that's the weakness of non-positional indexes. Um, we've got a time for a couple more. Yeah. Um, so do you mean weighted by uh, where the, you say this term is much more important than this other term? Yeah, so we don't, we don't do it directly, but we send the weight signal on to the ranking stage afterwards, which decides how important the match is. Um, I'm not sure how you do weighted queries directly in BitFunnel, but I'll give you an example of a type of query that's really hard for most things, um, which is a, a kind of a soft AND of, say, you have an AND of five things, but you'd like it to find anything that matches four out of the five things or three out of the five things. Um, right now, we don't know any way to do something like that other than to make a big OR query. So, yeah. Yeah. 
electronic system. Um, this is a straightforward plug in play thing where you swap in the front knowing you can use the same board. No, I wish it was. Um, so, so again, you know how I was talking about BitFunnel grew quickly from a small thing to a big thing, and their key goal initially was market share. So the architecture was not factored at all when we started working on this. So data structures from inside Mar Monarch were handed directly to the ranking algorithm. Um, during the p time I was here, everything got broken into microservices, and this said that all you could send to the ranker was information that you send over the wire. But um, that was one of our barriers to entry because they'd say, oh, you don't have a whatever data structure that Monarch has. Um, and the only reason we got by that is everyone knew we had to move to microservices and we had to factor stuff. That's more, more on the abstract level, the false positives of BitFunno, is it different in characteristic than the false positives of the inverted index? I guess there's no false positives. Yeah. Well, the inverted index doesn't make false positives, but um, I don't have time to show you the slides, but instead of propagating search forward from the query through the Boolean matcher and stuff, let's start at the far end, and let's imagine that we have this oracle that given a document and a query can give you a score and tell you how good it is. So a really naive search engine would be just do a for loop over the entire internet, handing each document and the query to the oracle. Um, but that would be too expensive. So everything we do up, upstream of the oracle is try not to hand it documents. And so keyword matching is a way of filtering out documents. And so the trade-off with BitFunnel is that we can filter out documents faster, but we'll end up handing them a few more documents. So we might give them 10% more documents, but our stage took a tenth of the time. So um, the nature of the false positives don't seem to affect the ranker other than they have a cost, that it has to rank them and discard them. There is this quirk that I suspect is there, and I've never found, but there must be pathological queries in BitFunnel, just statistically speaking, that every time you do this query, you will get horrible answers. It'll say every single document matches or something like that. And I haven't found those, but it was a big fear when we put this out into the public because we figured someone would stumble across one of these and there'd be a news article and it'd say, hey, look, you can type this weird thing into Bing and it does something weird. And we figured whenever that happened, we'd have a cache on the front end for those queries to eliminate them. But we never found one. Um, so I'm sure it's out there. I'm sure there's words or queries that have really bad false positive profiles because they have to because it's just probabilistic. Um, but, but from the ranker's point of view, the nature of the false positives, it seems it's just the quantity of them. Um, any more questions? Yeah. No. Um, we actually have it split across 2,000 machines, give or take. Um, think of it as we chopped our crawl of the internet into 2,000 pieces. And each piece we're saying, tell me the documents in your piece that match. And in another piece we're saying, tell me the documents in your piece that match. So the query doesn't really span the two pieces, the two shards. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, so we actually, there's at least three indexes in Bing, and there's one of them for long tail queries, which is term sharded. So instead of documents residing on machines, terms reside on machines. And instead of broadcasting one query to 2,000 machines, if the query has three words, you send it to the three machines that have those words, and then each of them sends their results back to one of the machines to intersect them together. Um, so there is an index like that, but Tiger and BitFunnel and Monarch are, were all document sharded. Yeah. So, so you mean like maybe have two copies of the same index that were made with different random number seeds? Um, no, I, I haven't really thought of it, mainly because the first thing worked. Um, you know, I, I'm curious about lots of things, like we've implemented it on FPGA, we've implemented it on GPU, we've, Microsoft Research has a project where they're making memories where each cell, each bit in memory has compute attached to it. And some of those are favorable to BitFunnel. Um, the problem with search in general, no matter what algorithm you use, ultimately it comes down to inspecting lots of data. And you have to get the data next to whatever's doing the inspection of it. So um, the FPGAs were good. 
because they had more DDR channels than the CPU. But the CPU work they're doing is really low, so the fact that it was a circuit didn't matter. It was the four channels. So um, we've looked at things like that, but um, people were really hesitant to use any more machines and any more space, so uh, we didn't really look at making two versions. Yeah? Yeah, but you can reduce this about time-grade level, right? I, I, I thought you were already doing that, but maybe I misunderstood it. Uh, so uh, if there's a particular term that's getting too many false positives, uh, then you can put two copies of the term in the index with different, uh, yes. with different filtering and then requiring to match. Yeah. I thought you were doing that. No, we could do that, but we never found a need to do it. So there was that brute force optimization. But like our, our hypothesis was terms with the same IDF, and we went out to one digit. Um, terms, or one digit after the decimal point. Terms with the same IDF behave similarly. And we went through the billion different term treatments you could have. So there's a billion of them because there's like nine digits with zero to nine rows. Yeah, and, and that was good enough. And so if, if one IDF ne was anomalous and it needed more rows or something, then it got them. Um, but I'm actually I'm, I'm shocked that we haven't found these pathological terms. I should almost like run some, now that I have like 1,000 machine clusters in Azure using like Spark, I should run a job and go look for them and find out how many there are. So it looks like we're five minutes over. Um, we should probably wrap it. I'm around if people have other questions. Thank you.